You know that famous Psalm, Psalm 23, it starts out with, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Isn't that so good to know that God's plan is to meet your needs, to take care of you, to be a good shepherd to you and I and meet all of our needs. Right now, Heavenly Father, we look to you and we ask you to supply all of our needs. Lord, we're asking for wisdom and understanding and knowledge. God, that you would be the answer to every crisis, every problem, every challenge that we're facing. And we say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God, I really believe that God has something very special, something on time for you today, talking about meeting all of your needs and that you will not want as you are led by the Holy Spirit and the good shepherd going before you, taking care of your needs. We're in True Grit, part three. True Grit, it ain't the pain, it's the gain. Oh my goodness, God has gain for us. It's kind of like our steel has been forged in the fiery furnace in the, on the anvil of life, but God is bringing something forth that's beautiful, strong, flexible, and amazing. He's forging our steel, but God is in control. It ain't the pain, it's the gain. Quick review. We've learned in True Grit that you never give up on you, on God, and on His good plans for your life. Never let go of believing the truth. You know, facts talk, but the truth. The truth is eternal and everlasting. We always want to hold on to the truth. Our key verse that we've been working on through parts one and two, talking about the truth, is just such an encouragement. It says this in Galatians 6 verse 9, and let us not lose heart and grow weary and faint in acting nobly and doing right. For in due time and at the appointed season, we shall reap if we do not loosen and relax our courage and faint. You got to remember that if. If we do not let go, right? True grit is for you. This series, I believe with all my heart, is for you. I do have a practical outline that's gonna help you. It's called Seven Steps of True Grit for Faith That Won't Quit, and I'm gonna be sure to give that to you. Seven Steps of True Grit for Faith That Won't Quit. But right now, I wanna lay out this principle for you that it ain't the pain, it's the gain. It's not the pain, it's the gain. True grit says, I'm not going to lose my grip. I'm not going to quit. I've got grit. Listen to 1 Timothy 6, verse 12. Paul is advising his protege, Timothy, and he says this, Fight the good fight of faith. Grab hold of eternal life, to which you were also called, and have confessed the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. But Paul says, fight the good fight. This is a fight of faith, he's saying. You're called to a fight, but a fight of faith, not futility. Your grit should be faith-focused. Never let your grit get pulled into stubbornness. No, that's not going to work. That's a path of self-destruction. Jacob was the youngest son of the famous patriarch Isaac. And Jacob was facing huge, big troubles. Look at Genesis chapter 32, starting at verse 24. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip. That's Jacob's hip. And the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. It's interesting here that the Hebrew word for wrestle signifies dust. Genesis 2 says, God formed us from the dust of the ground. The psalmist in Psalm 103 says, our frame is but dust. Jacob was having a spiritual wrestling match to overcome the flesh side, the carnal side of his scheming nature, the deceptive side of him, to let God's blessing in to get his prayers answered. It takes true grit to wrestle past the pain of self-preservation to the prize of God's promises. It ain't the pain, it's the gain. 
It's not about what you're letting go of, but what faith is grabbing onto. It's all about your focus. Are you fixated on the pain right now or focused on the gain? When I was a boy, my mom bought me this cheap guitar from Sears, and I was so thankful, so thankful, but I have to be honest with you. It was really a difficult guitar to play. In guitar talk, the action was so high, that means the strings were really high above the frets. So it took a lot of strength to push down and to get a good sound. I used to jokingly compare the distance to it being like a bow and arrow, which if you've never played guitar, it, it equated to a lot of pain. Oh my goodness. My little eight-year-old fingers felt a lot of pain and discomfort pushing down on those strings on that fret and learning how to play. But here's what I want you to see. The curve of my passion far eclipsed the curve of my pain. That resulted in grit. The curve of my purpose far eclipsed the curve of my pain. That resulted in success. The curve of my faith, my belief, far eclipsed the curve of my pain. That resulted in outcome. You see, a diamond is produced by withstanding a lot, I mean extreme amounts of pressure, extreme. We live in a culture that thinks the goal is to be excused from all pressure, every challenge, all strain, all pushing. The pursuit of comfort causes us to settle for cheap glass and forsake the goal of the diamond. A chunk of coal that has a pressure disorder, let's call it a pressure disorder, is like faith without patience. No diamond. James 1 says this, the trying of your faith works patience and let patience have a perfect work so that you may be perfect and entire, lacking nothing. No, no lack of diamonds in life, right? That's what sin is, turning from God instead of to God. It's a pressure disorder, a pressure disorder. We all experience pressure, but true grit helps us overcome sin, the temptation to move away from God by turning to God, looking to God for help. God gives us true grit for overcoming sin. Sin is a, a pressure disorder. You miss the target. Jesus used the word of God. It is written to overcome the temptations in the wilderness, the pressure that the enemy applied to him. He would say, it is written. That requires two things, knowledge of the word and true grit to turn the right way. You get to know the word by exercising true grit. I memorize the word of God, not because it's easy, but because it's life, it's health, it's strength. It's part of the true grit quotient. Look at Hebrews 12, starting at verse 3. For consider him, talking about Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. Jesus is our model of endurance, toughness, true grit. Jesus has got true grit. He knows how to handle hostility. We're being encouraged to not give up or be discouraged. We all have tests, trials, pressure, affliction. But greater is he who is on the inside of us. Greater is he who is in us, the champion of overcoming lives on the inside of us, than he that's in the world. Look. Chastening is correction, which is correct pressure, diamond-making pressure. It's what we want. When God chastens, when he corrects us, he does it as a loving Heavenly Father with his word, not abusively. Correction is evidence of God's love in your life, and that correction produces life, blessing, alignment. When Pam and I were first married, we had a discussion. Yeah, it was like a full-on disagreement, an argument. 
And after much back and forth, Pam's little square shoulders, they just seemed to slump in defeat. She sighed and said, okay then, you're right. It seemed like I won our little discussion. I started to walk away, move down the hallway, and, and I could hear the voice of the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. Ah, this does not please me, Stephen. This offends me, he said. Stephen, you're called to love Pam as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. You're supposed to submit to one another, not overpower the other person. Oh, I could hear the Holy Spirit clearly. God stopped me in my tracks. Thank God he stopped me in my tracks. He corrected me right on the spot. I immediately turned around and I apologized. And as always, Pam was just unbelievably sweet and kind about the whole thing. Jesus tells us in John 15 that God prunes us. How? He corrects us. How? With the word of God. Never give God credit for using the enemy's works of death and destruction to correct his sons and daughters. Never do that. Even in a third world country, that would be considered abuse. And yet, I know Christians who unintentionally malign and misrepresent God's character by crediting God with disease and destruction. My goodness, no wonder people run away from your God if you're doing that. God is not the author of car accidents. God is not the author of disease and sickness. God is not the instigator of tragedy and chaos. God has no pleasure in divorce or death. Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly, John 10.10 10 says. The devil, John 10.10 10 says, is the thief, the killer, and the liar. True grit holds on to God's truth in the midst of questions, trials, and tribulations. True grit refuses to allow God's name to be misrepresented by the circumstances and accusations that God somehow is misrepresenting His love and mercy by hurting people. True grit holds fast to the truth in the midst of a sea of questions and difficulties. Do you even have a clue how many young people have jumped into the religion of atheism because an authority figure who supposedly represents God ignorantly gives God credit for killing people, causing tragedy, refusing to protect a loved one, or making someone sick? Oh, these are all devilish lies intended to cause offense in a heart and resentment toward God. My friend, true grit, it ain't the pain, it's the gain. In kingdom talk, there should be gain. It takes true grit to resist being like Job's friends, and instead of comforting him in his trouble and his hour of need, they had to open up their big mouths and blame God for all the evil coming in on them. It was ugly. It was a misrepresentation of God's divine character. Well, all that we can figure out, Job, is that you, you must have been such a bad guy that God is just needing to beat you over your head with a stick so that you'll learn some lessons here. God was angry with them because they were misrepresenting his love, his character, his compassion, his mercy, and his ability to help and save. My dear friend, if you're going through a difficult time, God is not the source of it, but the answer to it. True grit is the enduring ability to not blame God, but trust God, to know that God's the answer. God loves you. He loves you. He cares for you. He tenderly has set his affection upon you. God the Father is your protector, your healer, provider, deliverer, strengthener, and helper. Why would God give you his son Jesus so that you could be called his child and then turn around and abuse you? God is the best parent in all of the galaxy, the universes, the worlds, by at least a billion times a billion, he is not an abuser. Grit overrides the desire for comfort to attain calibration. And calibration produces accuracy in life. 
okay? So grit overrides the desire for comfort to attain calibration. Let's face it, the Word of God has the supernatural ability to calibrate our thinking to the mind of Christ. That's absolutely astonishing. As a child of God, you have rights to the mind of Christ, but you need to attain that calibration. It's not natural. It requires true grit to let go of what's comfortable, what's usual, what's typical, and even carnal in exchange for God's best and God's highest, His thinking, to let go of your thinking, to grab a hold of His thinking. For example, being selfish, well, that's natural, but the problem is it's a contradiction to your design, your identity. Being jealous and envious is doubting God's goodness. It's thinking that God doesn't have enough for you. Somehow he, he, He's going to run out of a supply for you. Now, all of that is natural. It's typical. It's just very natural, carnal thinking. And so it requires grit to change to life calibration. Thinking carnal is uncalibrated thinking. Shifting to the mind of Christ requires application of true grit. And it says, first, you will not tolerate that thinking to be applied in your mind. No tolerance for carnal thinking. Second, grit says that you must replace that carnal thinking with God's higher thinking. True grit just won't settle for the lower, for the natural stuff. I'm going to give you the practical in the seven steps of true grit for faith that won't quit. You're going to like that. But right now, let's keep going. We have to learn to run with patience. Keep going. Run with grit. True grit. We're being watched. Did you know that? Your life matters, and you're being watched even from the supernatural realm. It's a race. It's a contest. We're called to strive for life, not against each other, but for life. To run with patience means you run, strive with an attitude that doesn't give up. It's got true grit. Diamonds are brought out of coal when there is prolonged pressure. The diamond of your design doesn't truly manifest until you've overcome and persisted through the fire, and through the pressure. Jesus is the author of our faith. And our faith needs to be tried. It needs to be fired. It needs to be put into the forge and brought out of the furnace. That demands true grit. Look at what Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 says. It says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, there's that spiritual cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Oh, my land, you've got to despise the shame. You've got to let it go. It ain't the pain, it's the gain. You're biblically called to be reward motivated. It ain't the pain, it's the gain. Hebrews 12 tells us Jesus was reward motivated. The cross wasn't a religious ritual, but he was enduring it for the joy, the reward set before him. So let me say this right now. Stop wanting things, pursuing things that you're unwilling to truly invest in. Well, Stephen, I, I just thought that Jesus paid it all. Uh, you know, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I mean. There are choices that we all have within the context of God's blessing that require us adding true grit to our faith. That means you've got to put some corresponding action to your faith, right? Of course, Galatians 2.16 says, we're not justified by works, but by faith. And James 2.17 says, faith without works is dead. Those works are corresponding action. That means if you're believing God to get in shape, you may pray for a treadmill, but you've got to work the treadmill, don't you? You may pay the price for some weights, but you have got to lift the weights. You've got to pay the price for getting in shape. That means you're going to be sore, aren't you? 
I mean, that's the goal. You want to be a little bit sore so you know you're getting something done. Some people pray for a bigger house. Well, that's fine. But you're going to have to have some more square footage to clean, aren't you? Your taxes are going to be higher. Washing the windows will require more soap and more work. Corresponding action. Some people are praying for a marriage partner. Well, you're going to have to let go of your singleness, aren't you? And realize that you have to prefer the other person now and maybe vacation where they want. Do what they want to do. You can't pray for a great spouse and not be a great spouse. you got to be willing to change and become what God wants you to be. So you've got to get in shape. you got to shape up. God can bless you with a wonderful husband or wife, but you've got to have the true grit because all blessings have to be managed, maintained, invested in, watched over. You pray for a baby, you got to be willing to take care of diaper duty, right? You don't get a new car without having the new responsibility of fueling it. You don't get a new baby in your family without increasing responsibilities for feeding, diaper change, all that kind of stuff. You see, that's the problem with winning the lottery. Most people have no clue the mental, emotional, relational grit required to manage that kind of financial increase. That's why so many winners say their life was far better before they ever won the lottery. You need grit to even work your faith. We all have to pay a price to make right choices. Remember, I'm going to give you that seven steps of true grit for faith that won't quit. It's going to be simple, simple action steps that you can take for seven steps of true grit for faith that won't quit. You see, faith moves mountains, but not if it quits, not if it gives up. Jesus said that faith is like a seed and no matter how small it is, has great power potential, but you must apply true grit, patience to let it have its perfect work come to its desired outcome. It ain't the pain, it's the gain. What's your focus? What's your focus? Have you ever seen someone try to push their way out of a door that says, pull on it? They're like, push, it says pull and they're like pushing away. That's not a case for more grit, is it? But wisdom to read the sign and then try again by reversing and pulling now. Faith is not independent of God's wisdom. Jesus is our model of true grit, and he wants you through the door of blessing. Yes, he wants you through the door of blessing. True grit employs faith to know you're at the right door, but wisdom to hear God's word and be corrected to pull instead of pushing. You may be in extreme pain right now. Maybe you're fighting tormenting thoughts, destructive voices, memories, and addictions. God's not intimidated. No, he's not intimidated by your pain. Your problems don't make him turn his back on you. Don't waste your pain, your crisis right now. Turn it all over to the creator who is able to exchange all that pressure and affliction for diamonds of glory, his glory. He loves you so much and he will not waste your pain, but you need to turn it over to him. It ain't the pain, it's the gain. Focus on God. Focus on his deep, deep love for you right now. Do you want what's on the other side of the door of life? You can authorize that faith pull on the door of life because you have delegated authority to say yes to Jesus. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, just pray that way. Just say, dear Lord Jesus, I want to go through the door of life. I want to listen to you. I choose your way. Here's all my pain. Help me, Lord. Forgive me for all my sins. You died on the cross for me. Rose up from the grave. Come into my heart. Fill me with your spirit. Give me your overcoming nature. In your name, Jesus. Amen. 
Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. Get our free app with the daily prayer and join us for this Tuesday Talks for an exciting, interactive question and answer and prayer time where we talk about what's important to you. At Living Room Church, you are loved. And together, we live life strong.